If I were to tell you that this one indicator would be able to tell you if the world was about to blow up, would you pay attention? The doomsday clock is now at 90 seconds to midnight, but is this really the most dangerous time in history? Could it be worse than the time the fate of the entire world depended on the gamble of a single Soviet man? Well, in this video, I'm going to reveal exactly what happened. I'm also going to reveal four other times we almost blew up. Since you're watching right now, go ahead, take a few seconds and see if you can guess four other times we were on the brink of mutually assured destruction. If you're really confident, go ahead and comment with your answer. After the release of the atomic bombs Little Boy and Fat Man on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively, a group of scientists published a magazine referred to as the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which in 1947 featured the Doomsday, the Doomsday Clock. Clock. It was originally set at seven minutes to midnight. This was a time when the Cold War had commenced. The specter of man-made technologies cast their shadow across the entire globe. The clock was intended as a visual metaphor that attempted to depict the threat of nuclear war and widespread destruction. Over the years, it also factored in socio-political factors, bioterrorism, climate change, AI, and cybersecurity, amongst other things. If you're getting some value so far, go ahead and subscribe and let me know in the comments below. Critics point to several problems with the clock, however. The bulletin has used phrases such as doom's doorstep and on the brink of a precipice. Some claim that this rhetoric induces panic or even a sense of paralysis in the face of issues too big to rectify. Others point out that the exact time on the clock doesn't appear to be scientifically determined and that in some cases certain threats are overplayed while others are not noted. Steven Pinker observed that there seems to be a lack of objectivity, leading the clock to be further from midnight during the Cuban Missile Crisis and yet closer to midnight during a seemingly benign 2007. Others point out that climate change is not exactly tantamount to nuclear war and does not play out on the same timescale, but seems to figure heavily into the as yet undetermined methodology by which the bulletin sets the doomsday clock. However, even if all the above were true, that wouldn't change the fact that the world has indeed been quite perilously close to widespread, if not global, destruction many times in history. You wouldn't believe the sometimes silly mistakes that led to these near Armageddons. Sorry. One such time was when the ballistic missile early warning system in Greenland detected dozens of missiles launched from the Soviet Union coming right over the North Pole on a trajectory for the United States. Deep within the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, NORAD acting commander Robert Gold had about 20 minutes to respond with a retaliatory strike. But there were a few problems with the threat detection intel. One was that, according to US intelligence, the Soviets had only about four ICBMs, not dozens. Another problem was something that Gold's chief of intelligence pointed out. Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, was in New York at the UN and would therefore not be launching an attack on himself. Luckily for the US and for the world, NORAD's chief of intelligence was clearly an intelligent man. The missile warning system had mistaken the rising of the moon over Norway as a barrage of missiles. On a likewise tense day on October 27, 1962, the Soviets and Americans were at it again this time, the Soviets went after an American U-2 reconnaissance plane, which had gone astray into Soviet airspace due to the Aurora Borealis. The U-2 was rescued by two American fighter jets armed with nuclear missiles. Luckily, the jets did not encounter the Soviet MiGs that were sent to destroy the American reconnaissance plane, and therefore they did not have to deploy their nuclear arsenal in an all-out dogfight. But on that very day, there was another near nuclear incident. A Russian B-59 sub was attempting to evade an American destroyer ship. The destroyer launched practice depth charges to warn the Russian sub to surface. But thinking that he was under attack, the Russian commander readied a nuclear-tipped torpedo. Fortunately, a member of his fleet talked the captain down, and the second nuclear crisis of the day had been averted. 
Just two days earlier, on October 25th, 1962, a guard in Duluth, Minnesota, spotted an intruder scaling a perimeter fence. He shot at the dark figure before sounding an alert. This triggered a succession of alarms, including the erroneous activation of the klaxon system in Volkfield, Wisconsin. Air raid sirens, which in the setting of DEFCON 3, signaled the launch of nuclear-enabled F-106A interceptors, which were about to take off when an officer who knew of the error sped onto the runway in a car to stop the fighter jets. The intruder that started it all was a bear. There was no confirmation of whether it was a Russian bear. In another incident, which did not involve bears, the Pentagon, NORAD, and the Strategic Air Command were all alerted that somewhere between 200 to 2,000 Soviet-launched ballistic missiles were heading toward U.S. soil in the early morning of November 9, 1979. In response, the Strategic Air Command readied a fleet of nuclear bombers. Luckily, satellite data confirmed that there was no Soviet attack. The almost nuclear fiasco was traced back to someone at the Cheyenne Mountain Complex inadvertently loading a training scenario into the wrong computer. Following this incident, Soviet General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev stated, I think you would agree with me that there should be no errors in such matters. The errors, however, continued into the next year. In a span of three months, three computer chip malfunctions led to false alarms and one instance of the Airborne Command Post, the survivor mobile command that carries the president in times of nuclear or national threat, to ready itself for takeoff. An even more alarming incident transpired on September 26, 1983, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union almost fell headlong into an accidental nuclear war. Leading up to this fateful night, the palpable tension between the two countries had escalated due to the U.S. mobilizing over 100 Pershing nuclear warheads to Western Europe, essentially aimed at the Soviet Union. The Soviets, for their part, had just shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007, killing over 260 people, including U.S. Congressman Larry McDonald. According to Bruce Blair, a Cold War expert, the Soviet Union was on hair-trigger alert it was very nervous and prone to mistakes and accidents. The false alarm that happened on Petrov's watch could not have come at a more dangerous, intense phase in U.S.-Soviet relations. Just after midnight on September 26, the Soviet early warning system detected an American ICBM headed for the Soviet Union. However, citing the unreliability of their error-prone satellite and the implausibility of an American first strike consisting of only one missile, Petrov did not alert high command. When the system later detected four additional missiles, he employed the same logic and waited things out. Petrov's gamble paid off. The missile strike was actually an error caused by sunlight reflecting off of high-altitude clouds. The world had again avoided a cold-to-hot war transition from which it may have never recovered. As these incidents demonstrate, even very serious issues like nuclear war can have silly, almost comical underbellies, like fence-climbing bears, Norwegian moonrises, and training videos played on the wrong computer. Science, too, can often be built on a silly backbone. Check out this video for a case in point.